gender imbalance, toxic masculinity, has only increased since the start of the war. In fact, it had been accelerating for many years before the war started, but this was sort of a tipping point that really led to a full repression on virtually all levels of society, but also in the areas of women's rights and gender dynamics. Um, increasingly, we see Russia and the Kremlin dictating roles for men and women according to binaries based on propagandistic uh, archetypes of traditional values and expecting people to act as defenders of the fatherland. Um, and for those who don't conform to these norms, there's increasing pressure on them and um, really grim consequences. Repressing people's right to gender expression is leading to problems such as domestic violence, um, you know, alcohol, drugs, and mass popula population exodus and a demographic crisis. This is uh, nothing less than a human tragedy. Um, and, you know, given the current regime and the current war, there's little chance of it changing, but there is a sign of optimism in the thousands of Russian women who have been organizing to resist the war, um, as well as the thousands of Russian men who are conscientious objectors resisting military service. So um, let's get into it. <laughs> there's a lot of information, so. I'll try to go fast, but um, yes, this presentation will cover a um, number of topics, uh, the general role and optics of gender in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the traditional values, propaganda messaging, and how that plays into repression of gender expression, uh, the way that women in particular are depicted and exploited by propaganda during the war, um, the suppression of feminist activism, as well as the women-led resistance against the war. Um, women political prisoners, we'll touch on them. And also the negative impacts the war has had on masculinity and Russian men, because it's equally as damaging for them as it is for women. Um, and what the future for women's rights may look like in Russia. So um, before I start with that, I just want to note really quick, uh, this lecture is not in any way meant to diminish or disregard the atrocities experienced <laughs> by Ukrainian women and girls at the hands of Russian forces. Um, that is a real crisis in itself. Um, but today we'll focus on things inside of Russia domestically. Um, for the purposes of timeliness, we'll focus on uh, narratives and uh, issues affecting non-queer cisgender women. Um, the situation with LGBT Russians is very grim, um, but given the sense of time, we will just focus on women's issues today mainly. Um, and I want to encourage you to think about gender in a universal scope. I think calling things women's issues is a little bit reductive sometimes, and it allows us to kind of put things aside and be like, oh, that's a women's issue, you know. Um, but women's issues are men's issues, and men's issues are women's issues. Gender is a part of everything, especially this war. Compared to patriarchy in the US, Russian women are expected to be everything in what I've observed. They're expected to have a career, be very educated, be very manicured and feminine, raise children. They're expected to do it all. And, um, you know, um, in the past decade, especially, the Kremlin has pushed this narrative of traditional family values and a nuclear family with one mom and one dad. Um, and it contrasts this with the West, um, you know, relative gender freedom, LGBT freedom, which uh, the Kremlin claims is being weaponized to destroy Russian society. Um, at the same time, when the Kremlin pushes these traditional values, like at the same time as Russia having one of the highest divorce rates in the country, many children raised by single mothers, and there is a really huge domestic violence problem, which is enabled by uh, lax legislation and enforcement by the authorities. So this is a clip of the title of the lecture. В Киеве то говорят, что будут соблюдать, то говорят, что это разрушит их страну. И президенту действующему недавно заявил, что ему ни один пункт не нравится из этих Минских соглашений. Но нравится, не нравится, терпи, моя красавица. Надо исполнять. По-другому не получится. This was said in the weeks leading up to the invasion of Ukraine. Um, Putin was talking about uh, the military buildup on Ukraine's borders and blaming NATO and the West for that and claiming and saying Ukraine must be forced to implement the Minsk Protocol ceasefire between 
Kievan pro-Russian separatists. And he said this phrase, which comes from folklore, but it is also part of a song lyric from the Soviet era. And it's basically implying, you know, rape and necrophilia. And it's really steeped, the song itself is steeped in rape culture. And um, it outraged a lot of people. He, the Kremlin claimed that it was, he was referencing a folk thing from, you know, children's songs, but nonetheless, it was a really uh, disturbing statement to make. And it reflects these themes of masculine domination over Ukraine, and also, in a sense, over women and minorities in Russia that have been part of this war from day one. Um, so talking about the dynamics of the war itself and the optics of gender, uh, men serving in the military, uh, they face a lot of pressure to exhibit toughness in contrast to more stereotypically feminine traits. And um, this is even among young conscripts and people who did not know they would be sent into Ukraine, they're suddenly being forced to be this like super macho defender of the fatherland. And if they don't comply with this or if they refuse conscription, um, they are branded cowards. Uh, so sociologi sociologists say there's a differentiation between physical courage and civil courage in the mind of the state. And the former is more masculine and the latter is more of a feminine trait. Yeah, obviously the former is by the state is reinforced among men. Um, activists and rights defenders say that this sense of toxic masculinity has been behind many of the war crimes we've seen allegedly carried out by Russian troops in Ukraine, such as the rape of Ukrainian women and other atrocities. Um, there are women in the Russian military. Uh, they're not as commonly seen in Ukraine, but this photo, for example, is a Russian woman who volunteered to be part of the Russian military. Um, most often women are battlefield nurses or volunteers. Um, there are reports that Russia's military has started to go to women's prisons to recruit female prisoners to fight in the war. Um, and there are reports of a really rampant sexual harassment and assault problem within the military against Russian service members who are women. In propaganda, women are often portrayed as loyal and faithful and taking on all of the work themselves while they wait for their husbands to return from the war. That is what is depicted as the proper role for Russian women today. And uh, there is also a com concept of sacred motherhood, which was part of Soviet era propaganda surrounding women, but has seen a real resurgence today. Well, there are some really weird impacts of this. Um, there are groups on the Contactia, which is the Russian social media site of women who are organizing and, you know, trying to find Russian soldiers who they can date. And the there's this culture of like Russian women really wanting to like support the war or like find love in the Russian army. And it's all kind of tied into this uh, propaganda messaging. I'd also like to draw kind of a comparison between two women and how they've been portrayed in Russian propaganda. Um, Daria Dugina is, was the daughter of Alexander Dugin, who is a prominent far-right ideologue. Um, she was killed in August by a car bomb, and uh, many people think that the car bomb was meant for her father. But because she conformed with this far-right ideology and she you know, was a commentator herself on Russian television, uh, Russian media coverage depicted her as a martyr who died for the sake of Russia's victory. Whereas another woman, Daria Trepova, she is about the same age. She was arrested last week in connection with uh, the assassina assassination of a pro-war blogger uh, with a bomb. And there's a lot of uncertainty over her motives or whether she even knew that she was going to be part of that assassination attempt. Anyway, she, there are reports online of her being, you know, a feminist and supporting opposition movements. And as a result, uh, Russian propaganda really grabbed onto the, her feminism. Margarita Semenyan, who is the editor-in-chief of RT, she published some of her selfies that are like, you know, a little bit more suggestive and very much implied that uh, Daria Trepova's sexual freedom was connected in some way to her alleged criminality. So it's very much like this dichotomy of, you know, if you're a feminist, 
clearly you must be an extremist who wants to kill people. Whereas if you are supporting the Kremlin's ideology, then you are a martyr and a saint. There's a lot more nuance to both of these cases, but that's kind of the broad strokes of it. Um, next, I want to talk about Russia's demographic crisis, because this has a lot to do with how women are treated amid the war. Um, as you can see in this chart, this is a look at the population under 20 years of age. Um, it has been pretty much declining steadily over the past few decades, and UN projections estimate that it will continue on this path. Um, and this is a real problem for the Kremlin. And another look at it is here, you can see in 1897, this is the distribution of ages of the Russian population by each gender. And in 1897, it was pretty equal. It, you know, is a pretty good distribution. A lot of young people, whereas as you get to the older ages, there's not as many. And that's kind of how a society should look. Whereas today, um, you see that the population of Russia is aging uh, there are not as many young people, um, and this is kind of a trend that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. So the population is declining at a record rate, and the Kremlin very much sees this as a national security issue. Um, it is one of its key obsessions, um, and Russia's birth rate itself has been steadily declining since 2014. Um, there are a lot of measures aimed at incentivizing women to have children, but it continues on this path and trajectory. Um, a lot of Russian women today, given that the war has created a lot of instability and economic uncertainty, they are increasingly re reluctant to have children. Um, but the state continues to really push women to have children. In August, Putin re revived the Stalin era mother heroine title, and it's a state award for women who give birth to 10 or more children who survive. Um, that's kind of another reflection of the sacred motherhood concept that is being pushed in propaganda. Increasingly, we're also seeing reproductive rights come under threat in Russia due to the population crisis. Um, officials are looking at the tens of thousands of soldiers killed and the emigration last year of hundreds of thousands of Russians and a decrease in immigration, and they are kind of panicking, so they're looking to clamp down on reproductive rights and limiting access to abortions that are safe. Um, we see lawmakers increasingly propose to re restrict access to abortion medicines and also proposals to outlaw something called the child-free movement, which isn't really a thing. It's just people who choose not to have children. Um, so, you know, the efforts to restrict abortion come as abortions themselves in Russia are decreasing even nearly fourfold over the past two decades. Um, so the logic doesn't really check out. Uh, you think that if there are fewer abortions, so there will be more births, but that hasn't been the case. I think this is the clearest illustration of the Kremlin's thinking uh, and the state's thinking. It's actually really disturbing. Um, these are two anti-abortion ads that kind of went viral last March on Twitter. Um, they're saying, if you protect me today, I'll protect you tomorrow. Um, Russia sees this as a forever war, and it wants to raise the population to create more soldiers to fight. Russian women have been at the forefront of protesting the war uh, and resisting it in ways that are more subtle as well. Um, this is a young woman. She's holding a sign saying, uh, the Sixth Commandment, Thou Shall Not Kill, in front of the Christ the Savior Cathedral in Moscow. Um, one of the you know, most prominent forces in the women's resistance movement, resistance movement is feminist anti-war resistance. This was a coalition of a bunch of different feminist groups that created this larger decentralized campaign shortly after the war began. Um, today, it has nearly 40,000 subscribers on Telegram, and it's active in Russia and outside of Russia. Um, they do a lot of different actions and protests, uh, writing anti-war messages on coins and banknotes to kind of reach those Russians who might be, you know, watching state TV every night. Uh, and they also have helped Russian men fleeing mobilization by, you know, helping them buy tickets out of the country. Uh, so they do a lot of different things. Uh, mothers are also a prominent force in the war. Uh, 
they, as was seen in the Chechen wars, when mothers were going and lobbying Russian officials to find out where their sons were, um, that is being seen today. Um, they're organizing to, you know, lobby the authorities and get an answer from the military and the state over where their sons have been sent. Last September, when Putin launched the mobilization for the war, um, it really created a visceral response among Russian women. Um, many mothers of Russian men and wives and sisters, they did not want their relatives and loved ones to be sent to die. So uh, we saw kind of unprecedented female-led protests against this. So that was in the Republic of Dagestan, which is normally the region that is, well, it's more of a, there's less political dissent there than in Moscow and St. Petersburg, usually. So it is really mar remarkable that we were seeing women chanting no to war on the streets of their city. Um, so many of these protests, like the one in Dagestan, were taking place in regions uh, where there were a large proportion of ethnic minorities, like Yakutia, uh, Piryatia. Uh, and this is partially because indigenous Russians have been disproportionately targeted in uh, you know, being sent into battle. Uh, the number of minorities who have been killed in Ukraine is far out, it far outpaces the number of ethnic Russians who have been killed in Ukraine. And many of the men were afraid to protest mobilization due to the risk of being detained themselves and sent to the battlefield. So that was another reason why women play, played a major role. Um, this is another protest. We see it in Yakutia, which is in northeast Siberia. Um, these women are doing a folk dance and chanting, note to war. Um, and another way we can visualize this, uh, this is a chart showing the share of women detained in major protests in 2021 versus 2022. So you see for the ones on the top line in 2021, usually like a quarter or three fourths of the protesters detained were women. However, in September 2022, it becomes a much larger share. Um, and that reflects the majority female uh, face of these protests against mobilization. Women who protest the war and who protest mobilization have faced a number of consequences. They face the risk of detention and in jail. They face police brutality, uh, sexualized violence, um, intimidation and surveillance. Many have lost their jobs for just saying they oppose the war. Uh, LGBT and feminist activists from indigenous and minority communities are disproportionately under pressure. Um, and at the same time, these protests really reflected how unpopular the war has been among people who may have previously been politically unaligned or unengaged with politics. Um, so they were really significant in that sense. I think a lot of the public polling uh, seems to show that a majority of Russians support the war, but that's not necessarily uh, in correlation with reality. Um, it also, the anti-mobilization protests helped make it clear to the Kremlin the, of the really heavy political cost of doing so. Um, and that's probably why we haven't seen a second round of mobilization. Um, instead, the Kremlin will probably seek to mobilize people through more subtle and incremental means. Um, so here are two of the most prominent women who have been imprisoned for opposing the war. Um, Alexandra Skoshelenko is a St. Petersburg-based artist and activist, and last March she replaced supermarket price tags with facts about the war in Ukraine, um, including the bombing of Mariupol. Um, so she was arrested, and she's now on trial. She faces 10 years in prison for that act after she was denounced by someone else. Um, and this is a quote from a letter she wrote from prison um, saying, it just so happened that I represent everything the Putin regime is so intolerant of. Um, she's openly gay as well, and she's faced a lot of issues in prison with her mental health and um, 
you know, it's just a really sad case. Um, and Maria Panamarenko is a Siberian journalist. Um, she also published information on Telegram about the bombing of Mariupol. And um, even just doing that, uh, saying that Russian forces did that is punishable by jail time. Um, so she was sentenced to six years in prison. Um, and this is a quote from her final word in, co in court in which she, you know, kind of really stood for what she did. And she said that patriotism is not manifested in the encouragement of crime or corruption. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, women activists in Russia have taken a lot of more subtle, quiet resistance techniques because of the risk of protesting on the streets. Um, these take the form of writing letters to political prisoners. There's a lot of campaigns doing that. Um, many women organize legal aid and you know, pay legal costs for people who are detained at protests. Um, many of them provide aid to Ukrainian refugees in Russia, or if they're based outside Russia, they also fundraise um, for Ukraine. Uh, there's a lot of sharing anti-war memes online and posting anti-war messages in public spaces, um, as well as just sharing information um, to help people understand their rights and how to invade mobilization and leave the country. Uh, it's a subtle, tact subtle tactic to avoid being detected. However, we are seeing uh, increasing calls among Russian lawmakers to crack down on any kind of feminist thought, um, which is a very vague concept, and it can be applied very widely. Um, a lawmaker in the pro-Kremlin United Russia Party this month proposed a law that would label feminist thought and just feminism in general to be an extremist ideology. Um, so that would effectively, um, if enforced, as liberally as it could be, it would ban any kind of advocacy for women's rights. Um, and in this quote, you can really see kind of a reflection of the hardline Russian thought. Um, you know, feminists in the West are all against Putin, against Russia, and for the war. Um, you know, they seem to think that by advocating for equal rights and for criminalization of things like domestic violence um, in the Kremlin and in the uh, State Duma Federation Council, they see that as threatening Russia's existence. Uh, that law, by the way, has only just been proposed. Uh, it's not clear if and when it will ever go in front of lawmakers, but it is kind of a sign of where things are headed. Um, and like I said at the beginning, um, this war is equally as devastating for men. Um, sociolo sociologist Olga Isipova has de described it as a crisis of masculinity. Um, men who return from the war have grappled with psychological trauma and they have trouble reintegrating into society. Um, they might feel emotions of shame and anxiety and restlessness. Um, and things like that are often tied with drug and alcohol abuse and aggressive behavior. Um, and the Moscow Times has interviewed some veterans who have come back from Ukraine and they report that although the military does offer mental health support, they themselves have not received any since returning from the war. Um, so oftentimes uh, the responsibility for providing this psychological support falls on the shoulders of women, partners, and caregivers at home. In terms of what the future looks like, uh, you know, as I can predict it, there are tens of thousands of anti-war Russian women who fled abroad last year, and they will continue to organize activist efforts, fundraising, any kind of support for Ukraine to help them win and to help people there, refugees. Uh, inside Russia, um, we will see an increased stigmatization and demonization of feminist and LGBT identities and thinking. Um, Legislation aimed at criminalizing domestic violence remains stalled and is unlikely to be revived anytime soon. Reproductive rights are also going to be under increasing risk. Um, I think that will be a real issue of coming uh, in the future soon. And um, within Russia, there are still some groups and shelters providing aid to women at risk and women who are in domestic violence situations, uh, but they are mainly at a local level and they often, I mean, they always operate with any kind of, without any kind of political element to their activities, because otherwise they would be closed. So um, to kind of sum it all up, 
Um, Putin sees this war as a forever war, and he regularly, in his addresses and public remarks, he is encouraging Russian society to just accept that this is the new normal and to really, you know, settle in for as long as it takes. Um, given that, the war and the propaganda surrounding it will continue to cultivate this domestic env environment in which any diversion from the status quo, whether it's diverting from support for the war or diverting from these traditional values, um, will be discouraged and even penalized. The Kremlin sees maintaining the status quo as key to its legitimacy, so it will be a real priority for them to crack down on any kind of digression from that. Um, subsequently, women and men will face increasing pressure to conform to so-called traditional gender roles with grim consequences, like we mentioned, with um, you know just breaking up of families and domestic violence, uh, alcohol and drug abuse. So, and not to mention the population crisis, which is a real problem for Russia and may be an unsustainable problem. So. I think that's basically all I have. Um, I know it was a lot of information, but thank you for listening. Um,